So today we've asked them to talk about uh, driving uh, adoption and challenges in adoption. Uh, and he's at um, Mount Sinai Ventures now uh, and uh, had come from uh, HHC, I believe, before that. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to welcome up here and let him bring his panel up. Uh, if you're on this panel, come on up. Uh, so I'll give the mic. Hey, I think I have the microphone on. Can everyone hear me in the audience? Terrific. Thank you. So uh, while everyone is uh, assembling on the stage, uh, for those panelists who uh, work on, uh, on the solution side, if you could sit to the left, and for those on the enterprise side, you sit on the right, and you can self-select which of those sides you feel you are most appropriate for. Uh, my name is Brent Stackos. Of course, I want to first thank uh, Alex Fair, uh, MedStarter, Data Art, and of course, PwC uh, for being the host and providing the opportunity to come up here and, and share a little bit of our knowledge. If I was any shorter, I don't think you could see me behind this podium. Um, so I'll, I'll try to wander over here. Um, prior to working at uh, Mount Sinai Ventures, I was at the City Health Department. Uh, I worked on a program trying to get doctors to adopt electronic health records. And it was back then that I had a chance to present at another MedStarter event on the Affordable Care Act, which I was just joking with my girlfriend earlier today. Uh, what a waste of time it was studying that, right? <laughs> so um, we, uh, we're really excited today to try to provide some clarity and some context and to give real world examples of some of the things that you guys have been hearing about all morning from the, the keynote uh, as well as the, the last presentation. And I, I thought that preliminary graph, uh, uh, if you want to call it that, that uh, image that you saw of the, the stages of adoption that were put up. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take those individual stages and we're going to break them down and take the experience of the panel here to share uh, some of their stories and try to give everyone here uh, some context. Now, my understanding is, is that we have, we have quite the mix in the audience today. So just a, a quick show of hands, who here works on the solution side? You work for a startup, you work for a vendor, you work for a company that's, that's selling to larger enterprises. All right, terrific. And then who's on the other side? Who works for an enterprise, a, a payer, a, a health system, a hospital, a multi-specialty group, a, a large vendor that actually buys products? All right, less so there. And then, who did I miss? For those of you who I, I did not identify, if you could raise your hands, just get a sense. All right, so predominantly on the, uh, on the uh, solution side, terrific. So what we're gonna try to do is provide context for those who work on the solution side around sort of best practices and lessons learned from our panel, which represent both the solution side and the enterprise side. And then of course, for those of you who do represent the enterprise side, to figure out how to be a better partner. Does that make sense? So uh, I'll let the panel introduce themselves and we'll start with uh, Steve Berman. How are you? Thank you so much, Brent. My name is Steve Berman. I head up innovation for Montefiore Health System. Uh, let me take 30 seconds and give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a CPA, worked on Wall Street for 10 years, started my own company, sold it, worked with three other startups, and I've been with Montefiore for the past eight and a half years. And my job is really to look at new solutions, vet them, and work with our clinicians and our IT department in bringing the best of breed to the health system to better take care of our patients. Oh. Hi, I'm uh, Les Funtleiter. I think I need this microphone. Thank you. Uh, I am an investor, so I'm actually in his uh, none of the above category. I run the uh, healthcare portfolio at Eastgrid Asset Management. We are uh, a family office. Uh, we invest both in public and private companies, and uh, I'd say about 30% of our portfolio is uh, in the, on the private side. We are looking for interesting solutions. Uh, we haven't found any good ones uh, lately, but we're always over to the possibility. Uh, I lecture at Columbia. I wrote the book Healthcare Investing, which is $33 on Amazon, for those of you. Who <laughs> and I've uh, been doing this a very, very long time. Hi, I'm Rose Maljanian. I'm the chairman and CEO of Health Cause. It's a consumer provider engagement and population health advancement company focused on portal tools and strategic advisory services. My background, I was initially trained in critical care, nursing, trauma, transplant, open heart, and then took the business side, have had senior leadership roles on the delivery system side, health plan, and specialty benefit management companies, serve on a lot of national boards, and currently the chairman of the board for the Population Health Alliance. Great. Can you guys hear me without this? All right. Um, so I'm Dan Trencher. I lead uh, product and strategy for Teladoc. Teladoc is uh, the nation's uh, leading uh, telehealth company. Uh, so I uh, think 24-7, you know, 365 access to uh, virtual medicine um, through, our, uh, through our platform. Uh, my background, I've been here for about five and a half years. Prior, spent 10 years on the other side of the fence with uh, Empire Blue Cross and uh, subsequently Anthem uh, uh, here, in, uh, here in New York City. So great to be here. 
Thanks. Hello, I am Philip Gillick, and I am head of payer relationships and population health for Call 9. And um, what Call 9 is, is we bring the emergency department and critical care to the patient's bedside in a skilled nursing facility. Um, and prior to Call 9, I was spent over right around 20 years at on the payer side, so I kind of switched sides, and now I'm on the provider side, which has been interesting. Is actually where I started out, um, but excited to be here. Great. Good afternoon, uh, Matthew Sidney, uh, President and CEO of Pickwell, as I mentioned prior. Um, been on all sides, uh, consulting on the payer side, um, a little bit on the provider side on a consulting basis. Um, and I've uh, been with Pickwell now about six months. Prior to that, um, I helped to build, I ran sales and marketing for a company called Health Equity out of Utah uh, and built their sales team and helped to take them public and uh, hopefully looking to do the same here at Pickwell. So thank you for having me. Terrific. Thank you so much. So I want to actually start with you, Matt. Uh, on the first uh, moment that you are uh, working in a solution, you're thinking about going out into market, the most important thing is, is preparing your pitch and figuring out exactly what your sales pitch is going to look like you just said you were working in sales, you were working on the solution side. Tell us, what are your recommendations, what are some of the stories from the field on preparing sure. what your spiel is going to be? Sure. So um, I think Edward, uh, who I think is up here, um, said it best. You've got to know your customer, and you've got to spend the time and um, put in the sort of the sweat equity and learning about not only just the customer themselves, and, and one thing that's often missed in the process is how do your clients make money? So if you're going to a brokerage, it's very, very different, you know, and a technology-enabled brokerage. It's very, very different than selling to a health plan, for instance. And so it's critically important that you understand how they make money, what's their business model, um, and how do you fit in. And the answer may be you don't. And so they're not the ones you want to focus on. And so you go through that process that Edward described, in which you learn about their business. You learn about the various components of their business, where they're going, but equally as important, how, they, how do they make money? How can you help them make money? Um, and so that's been something that we've really focused our attention on um, at Pickwell. In particular, we're just, as I said, I've been here about six months refreshing the pipeline and, and kind of going through that process and learning about our current partners and prospective partners. And so uh, as an example, um, prior to my joining, they've been pitching the same large brokerage on our solution uh, for their private exchange for three years. Um, and all it took was understanding how they make money and understanding that they're a technology-enabled brokerage and that their margins are very thin. So the focus was really, how do I support them in the, without really taking a big chunk of that margin and growing with them? Um, taking a little risk. I, I thought that was well said um, before, in the prior talk. But that's really an important piece. And so you know, I, I think that's often missed by salespeople. So turning to Steve from Monterey Medical Center, Steve, you get pitched all day long. You look at hundreds of startup companies throughout uh, the course of a year. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of these companies coming to you, whether or not they're prepared or not, when it comes to uh, understanding how you get paid, how your system makes money? So I will ask the audience a quick question. You have two providers up here now. Ed will be up here, I guess, in a few minutes. You have Mount Sinai and you have Montefiore. For a raise of hands, how many of you know what the difference is between the two organizations? Because there is a huge difference between Montefiore and Mount Sinai. And let me just tell you very quickly, 86% of our revenue comes from government pay, Medicare and Medicaid. Our population, for the most part, is in the Bronx. How many companies come to me with great solutions for the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side. <laughs> How many of them speak 27 different languages? Because that's our population. How many of them have the ability, have the PCs at home, have the ability to access? Yes, it's true, they all have smartphones. I was talking to somebody this morning and they said, well, you know, what we, want our, we want our patients to do is we want our patients to go into this portal. And we want them to tell us about their life uh, plan. I'm sorry. I thought I was loud. They want, us, they, want us, they, we, they want us to, our patients, to tell them a little bit about their, their background, what type, their, their lifestyle. And I looked at the person, I said, is this really the population and demographics you want to start with? I don't think so. I think you're looking for a win. So what, what I'm looking for is how many of these startups, how many of these companies come to me and really understand our population, our payer mix, 
how we make money, what our pain points are, because it's clearly different for us than it is with any other providers in, in New York City. So my question to the panel then is, how do you go about doing that research? How do you do your due diligence in advance? What are some of the tips that you use? Where do you go for information? Um, I'll, I'll take a shot because, uh, as a Wall Streeter, uh, because eventually we have to go and figure out whether or not the companies we're looking at, and it's a part of the diligence process, whether they know what they're talking about or not. Uh, a lot of it's in the census data. A lot of it should be self-explanatory, like where you're located should probably, you know, if you knew anything about New York, which I know if you're coming from Silicon Valley, they're not going to know anything about uh, north of the 101. But the, the um, uh, it, some of it is self-explanatory. Some of it is sort of just a business model question. And I think for us, we actually do ask the question, how do you make money? And we're not even as cookie cutter as most. We'll, we'll take a complicated answer, mm -hmm. uh, although I think most investors would prefer you know, a more clear cut. Um, but the data is available, and, and, but actually to be fair, most of it is common sense. And you should, even, and if you don't know the answer, there are all sorts of ways to find out. You should be close enough to somebody in healthcare that they know somebody who can fill you in. I mean, if I spent 15 minutes, I probably could find, we could probably find the common link between us. Uh, and, but and if you don't have that, you're probably in the wrong industry anyway. Philip, what are your thoughts? Uh, one of the critical things that um, I came up against is when I was on the payer side, I had people pitching to me literally every day, and it would be, this is super exciting. I'm going to be able to save you all this money. And I'd be like, OK, great. OK, so just give us all of your claims data. <laughs> and oh, that feels like I'm giving doing something for you like that. Not having any data, I ran into so many pitches that were, we promise we know we can save you money. Just share tons and tons of data back with us. Mm -hmm. So going, coming to payers with that kind of blank slate, like you need to give us all this information, is a big flaw because you're going to be dead in the water. And I think that's probably what you guys ran into too. Like, yeah, we we need all of your data, and we can maybe save you money. That feels like. You're getting someone selling something to you, but you're giving more than you're getting potentially. So that's a big something to think about. So uh, I'm going to stay with you, Philip. So uh, thinking about sort of the next step in that uh, adoption process, which is really understanding your market segment, how do you go about identifying you know, which enterprise to be targeting? Do you go for the big academic medical center like Montefiore or Mount Sinai? Do you go for one that might be uh, more refined? If, if you are pushing a product that is really focused around value-based care, should you be marketing to health systems at all? Or should you be targeting payers or, or other in the markets? In an overly simplistic term, we kind of, um, we built this platform and it puts the patient first, but we also have to kind of follow the money and understand exactly who is saving the money for our product. And what was important to my company is that um, prior to my getting there, they were pitching and going down one trail, but the folks that were saving all the money were left out of that. So it was important that you do kind of a graceful pivot in that um, you don't abandon the original customers, but realize that the people that are really saving the money have more skin in the game. And I guess this sounds obvious, but it's pretty complicated, especially when you're, I know much if you're well in Mount Sinai, like if they're the ones that are at risk for their population, those are the folks that you should be talking to because these insurance companies like, we keep in our 10%, they got the 90%, go talk to them. <laughs> so it's been interesting just to kind of as, because healthcare is so convoluted that you need to, get some people that are from the inside out that can really explain some of the ins and outs and who would re how to really follow the money. Mm. No, no that, that brings up a sort of a, a great next point. So then how you've identified what segment of the market, how do you get your phone call answered? How do you identify who that individual is within these large organizations at times to be able to get penetration so you can actually start the process of trying to negotiate? Uh, Dan, yeah. you want to share what your thoughts yeah, on sure. this? Yeah, um, sure. And you know, as I said earlier, I've sort of played both sides of the fence, so kind of picked up the phone as, as, a, as well as made the phone call. Um, and beyond starting with, you know, who's going to pay and why, um, really digging a little deeper into, you know, whoever that person is that you're trying to sort of get to pick up the phone, thinking about, you know, who, what motivation do they have to pick up the phone and do business with me? And uh, you know, do they have the authority, or do they have the ability to do something with me? Right. So that's authority, that's budget, um, that's degrees of freedom, kind of in their job. Um, and so, just as a sort of an example, um, you know, we started as a company actually selling to large employers uh, because your average HR benefits manager at a mid-sized company 
had motivation because they you know, want to offer cool things, and that, that's a little bit of a motivator within a, within a large company. Um, they had motivation because their boss is saying, how are you going to save me money? Uh, and they also had the ability because you're not dealing with a, you know, a massive organization making decisions about healthcare benefits. You've got a pretty limited team. If you flip it over to then selling into a health plan um, you know, and, or a hospital, it, it's not a monolith with one series of motivations. Uh, you know, it is a series of departments with a series of people in there, each of which have their own motivation. Right? So if your business is about saving money for a large health plan, um, as I assume many are, is it the care management team that's going to be really focused? How is this going to make my life easier? Is it the sales force who wants to have something cool to sell to their new uh, self-insured accounts and I can show they're winning on a cost of care basis and really thinking through the constituencies within these organizations and saying, you know, how can I meet the motivational needs of that particular department and how they operate? Um, and that's just the foot in the door and then obviously you can kind of take it from there once you've gotten the audience. Uh, that's great. I just to share uh, from my experience working at Mount Sinai Ventures, uh, we, as you said, we are a very large bureaucratic organization. Uh, there are many, many doors to our organization and oftentimes uh, groups will call me thinking that I'm the right door, and you could not find a, a worse door to enter through. Uh, if I, I'm on the investment side, my, my, my uh, mission is to find the organizations that will move the mission of the hospital forward to invest in. If you're calling me as your first point of entry, uh, you have a very long road ahead of you. And the main reason being is that I, I have to look to my clinical partners, to my administrative partners for guidance and feedback on whether or not something I'm getting pitched is, uh, is exciting to them and whether or not there's an opportunity there. That's a 12-month, 18-month process for them to sit there and say, no, I've never heard of this thing. Gee, let me look at it. All right, let me talk to you know, whoever the powers may be within their department or division are. All right, now we're going to start a pilot process because we want to feel something out. And that'll go on for several months, and hopefully that'll be successful. And then at that point in time, they'll come back to me, hopefully, and say, gee, we really like this thing. We're, we're thinking about maybe engaging in a longer term. Uh, do you want to invest in it? That's painful. Uh, and I am inundated with opportunities every day because we have 42,000 employees who all have good ideas. So when I'm looking for the groups that have actually already gone through the piling process, when I'm looking for the people who are in the process of negotiating contracts today, that's the opportunity for me to be able to make an investment to bring to my committee for approval for us to move forward quickly. So when you're knocking on my door and you think, oh, this is my great point of entry, you have at least a year and a half, two years of, of, of process ahead of you. I'd be much more interested in having you come to me and say, gee, we're already piloting with the pulmonology department. We're already doing something with your pharmacy department, but I found your name. And then I can at least be referred to that individual within my organization to get their feedback to say, this is something they're excited about, or you know what, uh, we, we can't quite figure out how to make this thing work, or you know, it doesn't interface with Epic, which is the deal killer every <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, Rose, you want to chime in? Yeah, I was, I was going to. Um uh, have a cautionary comment on this one. How many people out there, since there's so many um, young companies, know what an FO is to a, someone on the buy side? Anybody know what an FO is? Friend of. Ah. So when you get in the door because your uncle graduated from high school with the CEO, don't think you have it knocked. <laughs> it's actually, you might get an extra level of scrutiny because as you've heard, Everyone here that is on the buy side just gets inundated with volumes and volumes. And what we ask our teams is, how did, how did they get in, especially if it's outside of the process? So if you have one of those great contacts, make sure they are sold. Because then our next question is, so is this a courtesy meeting or is the CEO really bought into this opportunity? So if you're going to use those great contacts you have, make sure that um, you really have a champion and not someone who's just uh, given a courtesy that then they can say it was done. Steve, you want to say something? Uh, I have one. I have a couple. One recommendation that is, if you believe you have a system-wide solution, you need to go. Ideally, if they have an innovation center go to the Innovation Center, to those people that vet those types of solutions. If you think you have a one-off department type solution, cardiology, radiology, lab, you have a better chance by going to that department. And then if they need additional vetting, they'll come, in our case, to the Innovation Group or the Innovation Person. We don't have a group yet. But, but <laughs> what, what I'm suggesting is if you really believe you have a patient engagement, you have a, you have a telehealth solution, that's a system-wide solution. To go to a department, I think, is in, in this environment, at least for us, and I think some of my colleagues, 
in the metropolitan area, it's not the right move. But if you have a one-off, a department solution, there's not a problem going to that department. I think it also depends on where you are within the timeline of development. And I think uh, something that I'm seeing a lot is organizations are coming to me that are in the proof of, proof of concept stage. And we're just not the right place to be trying to vet out a concept. We are way too big, way too bureaucratic. You might find an individual champion within the organization who's excited to test it out, but they might not have the political capital to actually bring it through to the next stage, which is what you, uh, you know, if you're in the earlier stages as an organization, uh, don't have the time to sort of figure out uh, uh, while they sit there and, and you know, uh, slog through what that process looks like within a big bureaucratic organization like ours. My recommendation to a lot of groups that approach me is, have you gone to someone else within the market to do that proof of concept? Have you gone to the large multi-specialty uh, organizations that aren't academic medical centers, that aren't hospitals with inpatient departments? Because they're far less bureaucratic. Oftentimes they're run by a CEO who has a very small executive team and who knows everyone within their organization. And you can go to one of those places, and, and New York City has, has many of them from ProHealth and WestMed and um, uh, Mount Kisco Medical, which rebranded Caremount, uh, to Allied Peds, Allied Physicians out in Long Island. Uh, CityMD is a large urgent care group. And these organizations, though many of them have been bought recently by private equity firms and large uh, uh, um, strategic players, uh, are actually far more nimble than us. And to come to my door or to come to our organization's door and say, we're currently being used at WestMed, we're currently being used at CityMD, gives us a sense around that proof of concept. And frankly, the New York healthcare industry is a very tight-knit group. We all kind of know each other. It's easy for me to pick up a phone at that place and say, what do you think? What's that experience like? And that'll save you a lot of time when you're trying to get to the point of a big enterprise sale. Uh, but I think a lot of smaller organizations come to these big bureaucratic institutions looking for something that we're just not nimble enough to be able to deliver. Um, One of the things that I point out, too, is, is when we use the term champion, um, and I think Rose is absolutely correct. The FO versus champion is a big, big difference. And as, a, as smaller companies, um, if you don't have a sales process in place where you're trying to get to know, and that's N-O as quickly as possible, um, and weed those cases out, you'll die on the vine. Um, it takes a long time. Um, and, and for an, someone who may be not quite as experienced in enterprise sales will think about, I'm going to go talk to Aetna, or I'm going to go talk to Cigna, or I'm going to go talk to Mount Sinai. And that's the win for them, right? So they're, they're going out and expending a lot of time and energy. And the problem is, is those sales cycles, if you're selling to Anthem, for instance, I heard that come up earlier, that's an 18 to 24-month sales cycle if you're doing it right. Not a pilot, but if you're actually doing it. It's a long, long sales cycle. And so if you're starting out and you don't have a lot of capital to burn, you're better off testing with the smaller groups are going after those that take less time to make decisions, I think, as Brent's pointing out. Stay away from government. <laughs> stay, I mean, absolutely stay away from government. And, and massive healthcare organizations are, are tough. They're tough. It's not that they're not good clients. It's that it's going to take you a long time to go through their due diligence process and security process. So be very selective when you start to build your proof points. Dan, let's talk a little bit about uh, that, that clinical champion, that, that I'm not clinical champion, but that, that champion for uh, the solution and what your experience has been at Pickwell and, and prior to that around identifying who the right champion is because yeah. that can make or break a deal. Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it is predicated in, in, on how you, how did you do your due diligence prior and do you know who is the buyer, who is the actual decision maker? And you may not be able to get directly to that decision maker, they may keep punting you down, but it's critically important that you strive to get there. Um, you want your champions to be able to put DNA into the process. And so I think as you were mentioning earlier, which is I want something from you. I want data from you, right? If, if your champion isn't willing to do that, to give you information, give you data, they're not your champion, number one. Number two, the other piece of that is, is, is understanding um, not only who the decision maker is, but how decisions are made. That will help you uh, to, to no end in understanding timing, understanding am I pushing the right buttons, and also if you're not the CEO or you have a head of sales, where do you start placing other people to start building a network of champions as well? But you'll oftentimes, for new salespeople, I, I just went and I have a champion at, at Anthem, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I've got a shot. No, you don't have a shot. You really don't have a shot, because the person you're talking to is not the decision maker. And what ends up happening is you waste a lot of cycles on that. And so when you're looking and you're doing your due diligence, I think as, as Edward mentioned earlier, you really want to know the customer, know who you're talking to. And if they're not the right person, they may, be the, they may be able to network you to the right person. 
So how have you gone and found champions? Um, well, I, uh, today, uh, actually at Health Equity as well, I leverage my board. You know, my board and specifically at Pickwell, my board's there for me. Um, a lot of times new CEOs will make the mistake of updating the board constantly and presenting to them. But from my perspective, the board is all there for me. And I've got Sandbox and Mass Mutual and University of Pennsylvania. These are, these are board members that I can leverage to help me network in. The other is, is that I just call other CEOs. Um, oftentimes, um, I'll see someone doing business with a company that I want to do business with, and I may know that CEO or be able to network to that CEO of that service provider, and I'll pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, listen, I want to get in. Who do I talk to? Who's the right place? Where should I go? And you know, the internet is full of, of good information, but at the end of the day, I'm a big fan of picking up the phone um, and finding out just how I know that buyer. How do I know that decision maker? Phil, what about your experience at Call9? Um, we have definitely been able to target and work with um, advocates for our product. But what I what we did find, and it took a little bit of um, time, is that when, especially when you're talking to payers, they all want to be innovative. Oh my god, I want, I want to be, be, and so they're really curious and interested. And um, the difficulty or the thing is to how to keep that person involved, even though you may know that they're not the decision maker, they're not the one that can sign. Um, but how to feel, let them feel like they are still involved in bringing this innovation to their company without overly just focusing on that person. So you don't leave them behind, but you bring them along with you. Um, and that's been really interesting. Um, we have found that um, a lot of success working with some of the medical directors at the, at the payers, which sometimes get left behind a little bit with the business people and having them be the advocate or at least not the blocker. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, were, they really like this program. Then the business people feel like, okay, I don't have to worry about checking with them. So it's more of like, even if you identify them, if they can't sign, working together with them to get you to the signer is what we've been yeah. doing. Yeah. One other thing I'd point out too is, is uh, um, when you're going through that process, especially when you're a service provider like us selling to enterprise, especially on the health plan side, is don't forget sales. You know, a great way to get into an organization for the, your first step is to get in front of a senior salesperson. If you've got the chops to do it and you've got the product that can help them sell mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily have your ROI story broken down yet, get in front of them, get visibility, because the last thing in the world you want is the sales team who tend to be, at least on the health insurance side, the loudest. You don't want them saying a product or innovation, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'm not seeing that in the market. I don't want anything to do with that. You want them saying, oh, I've heard of those guys before. It's a great way to keep, your, keep yourself out of hot water and waste time. Dan from Teladoc. Yeah, and actually maybe building on the last point, one thing we were actually successful with is you know, health plans from the sales perspective are most motivated when their clients are starting to do something um, and they feel like they're getting left behind. And so we had a lot of success driving adoption amongst uh, some employers who then, you know, once they were buying directly from us, their carriers, whether it's an Aetna or Blue or whomever, said, I, I should be selling that. Why am I letting my clients to contract directly for that? And that really motivates, um, you know, health plans as well. So sometimes it's sort of a two-parter. I realize that doesn't take, you know, a couple weeks. That takes a little time. Um, but that can be very motivational as well. Rose, anything you would advise? Yeah, I think that um, you know some organizations, it's the uh, product or I innovation team, and others, um, I IT will have a, a big impact. So it's it's really looking at. I mean, I I certainly read carefully the bios um, that are posted on the website, get a sense for what what they're doing, and um, focus in on someone that at the end of every meeting and call that I'm clarifying that they're going to be the person I'm following up with. The worst thing that you can do, because these organizations are so busy, you've got yourself a good senior level product lead, and next they're too busy to attend one meeting and you're with someone on their team. Next that person's too busy and you've got um, a, another junior person and, and you end up um, on a call with an associate business analyst when you started out with an SVP o over product. So you have to be really clear that the main point of person is the one that's going to help you close it, welcome the others on the team, be respectful, but make sure you're not turfed down into the organization too deep. Uh, that's great advice. Uh, so, something that I see uh, at Mount Sinai uh, is I try to play something of a, a Sherpa role, bringing some of these organizations sort of through our process. And yeah. what I see at times is that they're finding themselves with a champion who actually doesn't have political capital. Uh, that individual is busy or distracted with a million other projects. And yeah, they have a big name and a big title, but with it comes 
tons and tons of responsibilities, too many responsibilities. And so although they might be excited when they meet you at first, you'll find very quickly that they're not giving you the attention that you need. Or worse, uh, they actually have diminished political capital in the organization, and you probably won't know that, uh, but I certainly do. And I think well, a little bit of advice that I would have is as you develop these relationships within a larger organization, to be constantly asking that organization about the other people that you're working with. To say, gee, I'm working with uh, the chief of radiology. Uh, you know, are, are they, where, where do they fit within sort of the pecking order? You know, uh, are they at the senior executive meetings or do they report to someone else within the organization? And really trying to triangulate between all of your different contacts to understand on the back end, you know, what, how exactly these organizations are structured uh, from a, a political capital standpoint. Um, so uh, one of you touched on this notion of, of a pilot, and so I, I want to do a little bit of a dive in the pilot. And one of the things that um, that I think can certainly kill uh, a deal, but more importantly kill uh, a smaller company that's uh, at the startup phase is the pilot process. And so my question to the, the panel is, you know, how do you structure a, a healthy pilot? Do you even pilot? Is piloting bad? Uh, I've certainly been to a lot of uh, conferences recently where people say piloting is a, is a complete waste of time and that you're only bringing uh, pain and heartache to yourself and that you should be focused on the sales. So uh, I want to start with, with Phil again on this and figure out, you know, when your experience, do you pursue piloting and what are you doing in order to structure a successful pilot? It's, it's, a, it's a dangerous word to overuse, I'll say that. Uh, for my organization, when once we were approaching payers, um, first of all, none of them want to be first, but they all want to be second. So every one of them wants to be in second place. Who are you working with? Let, let us be the next one. Everyone can't be second. Someone's got to be first. Um, and when... We had to make it clear, and I had to make it clear back at my organization that we did our proof of concept. We are out of pilot. To make sure when you're talking, if you're out of pilot, say it. We've graduated. We're out of pilot. We're into launch. That's why I'm here. Because um, prior to my um, arriving, they were telling payers, well, we're in pilot. And they're like, yeah, why don't you come back when you have something fully vetted, fully baked? So um, be careful about when you're, when you're describing your program as a pilot. Um, you can nuance it a little bit when you're dealing with payers to say, like, we'll do, a, you know, well, let's do a geography of your population, but we try to stay away from the, just the word pilot because they think you're still working at the key kinks or you're in beta and you're going to, uh, they don't want to be the test. Less on the investor side. When you're looking at potential uh, investments and you hear that they are in piloting, how do you respond to that? We don't. Well, as, as you'd expect, uh, you know, uh, for us, we see a, di a t dozens, everybody's in pilot. Is it sort of like a free thing. Uh, for us, the ultimate validation is really, did somebody pay you to do what you said you were going to do for them? And for us, that's the, really the ultimate validation. Uh, I said we are more lenient than some, but, you know, we definitely want to see revenue. We don't need to see cash flow, but, and pilot means you sort of, in our, my world, means you just went in and gave somebody something for free just to see if it would work, and, you know, almost anybody would take that, unless you're a great big organization, in which case free actually is costly. Uh, but, but uh, and I, I would just want to go back to the following point that about, about sales cycle, uh, both underutilization of board members and investors, because we're an obsessive bunch, investors, as you know. And so we, we have no problem getting on the phone and calling other companies we've invested in and say, you should talk to these guys. And we, in fact, we do it all the time both public and private, we make uh, introductions because it's in our best interest. If we have t two holdings, we want to see them both do really re well, and if we think we can sort of make something happen, uh, we do. So I, I think investors, in addition to board members, are underutilized in terms of you know, helping your business. Uh, adopt. And just to build on that, uh, you know, from my experience, I, I'm also, uh, like Steve, a, a one-man shop. And so when you are pitching uh, strategic investor groups to recognize the fact that um, I don't have a fantastic due diligence process, which I will readily admit, when an organization uh, like Lessis comes to me with something they've already invested in, that gives my board, uh, my finance committee, a lot more confidence that uh, significant due diligence has been done by an organization that does this day in and day out. And so I I'm excited to actually pursue those investments that another organization has already invested in. And unlike other sort of enterprises, I don't need to be the first one. In fact, I probably don't want to be the first one working on something. I'd rather be the last guy in when it comes to uh, a capital raise. But uh, I'm curious, uh, from your experience at uh, Teladoc, yeah. you know, when you guys were starting out, 
or in your you, previous? Of course, you know, when you don't have a client, you do what you do to, you have to do to get your first, you know, sort of foot in the door somewhere to get to get a client. But I think very quickly, um, you know, the pilot words become the word becomes self defeating. And I think the biggest issue is, and the reason why the you sort of the, the temptation to use it is, well, it doesn't require much commitment on the part of the client, right? Don't worry, it's just a pilot. You're not committing to much. Uh, and maybe it's free, so you're not committing financially at all. And that's actually, I think, the biggest source of failure for the, whether you call it a pilot or not, the program is a lack of commitment on the client's part, because that's the surest way to make sure, um, you know, in our business, you know, our, our product only works if a consumer uses it, right? And they have to, there's marketing and there's working with whoever the plan sponsor is uh, to make sure people are aware of it, how to use it. And as soon as you say, don't worry, it's a pilot, they don't commit to marketing, they don't commit. Um, to, uh, uh, to really making it a success, and then at 99 times out of 100, it's a failure, and so what you've got is, there's nothing worse than a failed pilot, right? Because that gets out within the, the, organ within the world, too. Um, and so, uh, and when people aren't paying for anything, they, they don't see a lot of value in it, either. So, so Matt, tell me, you, you, you're moving forward, you're a startup organization, you, you need that pilot. How do you structure it for success? Yeah, I think, I think, as you were saying, and I think I heard someone else mention it, you know, defining what's, what's a win or what's a failure and what's a success. I think part of the problem that a lot of startups, they get excited that they've brought on their first customer, or their first pilot, quote unquote pilot. They don't go through the process of defining the, the, the one, the timeline of that pilot. So saying, this is gonna be a 12 month pilot and here's what's gonna be involved in that 12 month pilot. And I'm not gonna ask you to commit beyond that, but understanding that if we meet these metrics and define those together walk through what's important for the company that you're piloting for. Is it reducing call times? Is it reducing number of calls? Is it reducing you know, uh, uh, average stay? Whatever it is, be very definitive about it and don't try to do everything. Pick the one, two, three things that you believe that your product can do. And this is where you start getting the DNA of the company you're working with. Okay, where are you today? Let's work on that and be diligent about updating. And it's okay to be diligent about updating and saying, you know, I said we were going to reduce call handling time by 30 seconds, but we really haven't done it. You start to solution with the pilot or the company that's, that you're working with. And why that's important is, is they will feed you more information. They will help you get over that hump because they don't want to look bad internally or politically to, to, help, uh, to help you not only garner the information, but if it's marketing or it's communications out to the employee populations. If you can start to identify the reasons why, and you're very strict and diligent about the metrics by which and the timeline with which you're delivering this pilot, pilots are okay because you gotta do what you gotta do to get a customer. But if you don't define it, you as a business, forget, forget whether it's a successful pilot or, a, 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 or not. You as a business won't grow or learn from it. And so that's it's a whole other probably panel, but that's a really critical piece too, which is you won't understand what went south. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about the DNA a little bit more. Uh, Phil. Data. You're going into a pilot. What are you looking for when it comes to data? I would just caution not going too big because um, everyone is doing population health and doing all, but really focus on, try, try to always take yourself back to what was the original problem we were trying to solve because you can get really distracted on the other things you learn and, wow, we can do this, we can do that. And if you don't have just a specific core metric that you are building this product for, you can forget about that and then your customer that you're going to is focused on that first thing you said you were going to do. So I would just be careful of getting distracted by shiny other opportunities that come along and stay true to the first thing. Like you said, if it's called to make sure you did that. Um, sounds really basic, but people can get, especially when it comes to innovation and startups can get really distracted and someone's got to be watching that. And that's the fastest way to fail as a pilot too, which is you lose focus and you start entertaining other ideas because you think they're good but you will crash and burn. Yeah. It's a quick way to crash and burn. No, and, and something that I, I see just uh, as a lesson learned from the side that I sit on is that our, our legal department plays something of a gatekeeper. And if you're moving forward with a pilot that's really being done by um, uh, word of mouth with a clinical champion within our organization, you're not going through that regular process. And it's important that you hit that gatekeeper. My recommendation is you find a way to paper that deal up, at the very least a non-disclosure agreement, but some sort of letter of intent which does lay out what, what uh, Phil and, and uh, everyone is talking about here in terms of you know, what are those metrics that you want to make sure that everyone is trying to be held accountable to. And more importantly, what is the data that you need from this big organization in order to be successful? And maybe it's data for the pilot specifically. Maybe it's data that you can leverage when it comes to you know, continued development of your product. Steve, you want to chime in on this? 
Yeah, uh, it's a slippery slope, and we can kill you if you if you do a pilot with us. So you've got to go in. If it's because you need a first pilot because you're looking for funding, that's terrific. But as we as as was mentioned earlier, if you're going to set down metrics, there's got to be another question that each of you must ask a provider: Do you have the funds? Not if, but when this pilot is successful. I want to understand now where I'm going, and when I hit these metrics, you are going to sign an enterprise license, a department license, but you are going to pay for this solution. Am I correct? Because if you don't have that conversation, we love pilots. We love pilots for research purposes. I had to walk away from a pilot because our physician said, I'm doing this solely for research purposes. I said, if that's the case, I am not getting involved. Because that, it, to me, is, not, is, is an unethical way of dealing with a startup company. You're taking money out of their pocket because you want to do research, and you have no intention of using the solution after your project, after your research study is done. That's a very important concept, I think, for startups. Be upfront with us, tell us what you want, and get us to commit. So I, I want to end, end the panel section of this with, with Rose, and then we'll go to a Q&A for the audience. So get your questions ready. I think we have uh, mic runners uh, positioning themselves now. So Rose, you've gotten to the point where you've, you've structured your pilot. Now it's about pivoting to that contract, like Steve said. How do you integrate into the broader enterprise strategy? What has your experience been there, and, and what would you share? Yeah, I'll give um, three quick examples there. And, uh, and by the way, on the pilot topic, as a, both a buyer and, and a seller, I, I don't like the term pilot. I use um, multi-phase um, initiative. It's the initial and expansion. The contracts are done with an opener to mitigate risk if they're not happy and don't want to move forward with expansion. There's a 60-day out, but that, that's just uh, the, that's, way, that that's the way I, I approach it, advice. so we stay away from yeah. that ugly um, pilot word and always skin in the game, wh even if it's a small amount of, of money. Even if it's $10,000, get them to write a check. Otherwise, they're really not interested. So um, a few quick examples on that um, integration. And th this is a big barrier to sales not understanding it. So um, from large health plan land as a, as a buyer, now I'm the senior executive over uh, clinical innovation at a large uh, health plan based in Louisville. Um, and I'm looking at all care, disease management um, initiatives. We have a bunch of vendors already in place. We have our own internal care management programs. So where is there room for new entrants? We would run an annual, invite new folks in, and all of a sudden this company comes in, um, kind of off cycle, and um, they came in and they were in startup land, um, came in, knew I was responsible for health and wellness all the way to end of life, knew all the vendors that were already in place, what they had, they spent some time with my team before they came in, they knew what our internal programs were, and they pitched gaps in care a ahead of their time, and that we would have visibility on the communications to providers and consumers real time, and the uh, out outcomes um, metrics would be real time to us as well. They also knew the weaknesses of the various other players that were in place and were counter-marketing for that. They didn't have outcomes data yet, which was like, how did they get here again and <laughs> into here? But their modeling was very solid, and it was plausible. They had tied every metric they had in their plan to the outcomes. And I said, you know what? These guys deserve a shot. I think this serves a, a, a need that we haven't filled yet. And um, we did the deal with them, um, and uh, they, they ended up selling for hundreds of millions. Um, years later. Um, a, another uh, quick case, um, now I'm the buyer on the specialty um, benefits side, um, med psych in integration, and um, a startup's trying to come in to one of my clients to kind of corner us out on uh, some uh, depression care management. 
um, went in to our client with a very uh, naive pitch that they were going to do what we were doing um, better and uh, cheaper in depression, except they only wanted the mild cases, no suicidal, um, no in-person, um, no um, referral plan, and they suggested kind of that they had already talked to us and we were on board. So they didn't talk to us and we didn't think they were credible in the space and all I had to do in one phone call is describe some of the cases that our care managers were dealing with and say to them, why would you want to work with someone who doesn't do windows and floors, especially when we're talking about suicidal um, patients and just gave a couple quick examples from our call center and they were they were dead in the water and we ended up doing um, not only our own stuff but the depression screening for um, their uh, diabetes and cardiac cases as well so you know be very careful when you're trying to unseat um, a, a large credible organization and then um, finally as um, me now pitching as a startup company to organizations. Um, we had, uh, for our consumer-facing portal, um, our tools listened very carefully to the client and the, the usual ex kind of things. You know, they're really busy, um, can't, can't get it done. IT, there's all kinds of barriers in there. We, we went back and put together the solution along with offering to do the project management and the, um, IT, the IT piece, the API. We ended up being the consumer central for them and bringing in their other functions that weren't moving as quickly as they thought they would. So really listen to what those barriers are to getting your deal in place and uh, play, play to them, add some services around it to solve that problem for them. Perfect, thank you, Rose. Those are three fantastic examples of how to integrate into a, a larger system strategy to ensure longer term success beyond all the things that we started with here. So I want to turn now for take a couple questions. If I could get a, a show of hands for those who actually have a question. I see somebody has a microphone there, uh, sir. Hello, yes. Hi, I'm Roberto from HealthEat. Um, we're a startup. So specifically for Philip, because you were asked, you were mentioning about the startups asking for too much information since the very beginning. What would be like that sweet point where the payer is confident enough to provide, even if it's not all data, but at least some data, so that the startup yeah. can work with? Uh, we didn't get out our data like almost at all, so it was really a struggle. And and I, what was it was it's an interesting question because no one ever came back and said, can you just maybe give us these necessary fields or, you know, just this certain county, at least to make the other side feel a little bit like, okay, you're not really going to just take all of my data and, and do something crazy. So I think um, have a, have a, if you do need the data to prove your point, see if you can find a way to prove your point with other data that's more available and not so such a big deal for the payer to give to you or really just whittle it down so these this is really all that we need because they would ask for big because they would think they're going to find millions in my lab data or millions in like they're not going to find millions in every portion of my data really kind of parse it down to get the data that you need to at least make your point compelling a lot of them never came back once we couldn't give them everything it just kind of died thank you phil hi you've spoken a lot about how you respond to people looking for trials and funding for that but i was wondering what recommendations you might have for someone looking for early stage funding like seed funding pre-regulatory approval for like a medical technology? Uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna push it to you last. Okay, yeah. I mean, seed funding, we, um, my, my, the quick answer is find a rich person. Um, <laughs> because uh, institutionally, we very rarely will do a seed uh, pre-approval, especially in med tech, because inevitably med tech always take, even though it's not biotech, it always takes longer and costs more than you think. Uh, so, y yeah, really, that's, at that, you know, you're talking the less than seven-digit raise, you really need, you, or you need to know sort of semi-rich people um, and get a lot of them to come together. Uh, I think that's, I don't know about the institutions, if you guys ever go to that small to do seed, but it wouldn't. That, that's it, actually where we live. We, yeah, li we okay. live in seed investment. I institutions <laughs> like us wouldn't, wouldn't do something. I mean, the partners within E squared, for example, if we, you know, have a friend of a friend who needs, you know, we you might all get together and write personal checks. But I, as an institution, it, there's just too much, it, it involves too much of our time. 
So uh, my, I, I echo that. My recommendation is you, you go after that friends or family raise. Uh, there are grant programs uh, all over that potentially you can pursue. That is not a quick process, however. Um, but when it comes to anything that requires regulatory approval, uh, my organization uh, is a little reticent to move forward and, and make a seed investment in a company that we, we know will need FDA or, or other approvals just because so many things can go wrong. Um, but for those products that don't require uh, uh, regulatory approval, uh, we do. Uh, that is our sweet spot. That's what we invest in. Hi, I'm Howard Reese with Healthy Practices. First, thanks for some uh, real good insights. But um, my question is for the two providers on the panel. And at what point in the process do you allow a vendor to use your name as a named customer or a reference customer? in the contract, I mean, we don't have a problem using our name as long as we know and are, are told up front in what uh, capacity we're using the name. But no, no, in fact, uh, we, we would support that. We are in the process of rewriting our policy. Uh, that was something that we're a little bit more liberal with in the past, and we're in the process of uh, ratcheting down and having a real structure in place around that. Uh, I've made a couple of investments last year that I've still yet to be able to put our name on, um, which is frustrating. Any other questions from the field here? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, oh. I, hear, I hear a voice. I was going to say oh, we have time Alex. for one more question. So, okay. uh, no, but uh, we're good then. So, oh, hang on. We have one more. Okay. And then we're, uh, we're going to get break for lunch, and then we have a lunch and learn session in a little bit. So here you go, sir. Name and your company. Hi. My name is Craig Antico. I'm with a charity called RIP Medical Debt. We actually buy medical debt and abolish it. Uh, for poor and hardship people. But my question is, oftentimes we have uh, customer data or consumer data to prove that our impact is being uh, made, but we don't have the clinical data or administrative data, as we call it, in the, in the research side. Are there benefit people here, like in a managed care organization, that would, would say that, that the uh, executives would be willing to share data on their patient outcomes to see if my medical debt forgiveness would actually make an impact on that, you know, access to care, things like that. So, Any thoughts from uh, the pairs on the panel? A little bit of a departure from, I think, a lot of our experiences, Former unfortunately. Former yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, I know uh, there were a show of hands of a number of people uh, in the audience who do work on the payer side, and I think, uh, I'm sorry, did you say your name again, sir? Craig Antico uh, in the white shirt would certainly love your perspective. You can share it. Uh, the, the thing that I would say is that, um, and we ran up against this when we, we actually did get a deal with Anthem pretty in a shorter order, but it was about us having um, some data and some spreadsheets that felt less risky to the payer and giving them the information and they populate their data and see it for themselves. Ask them to give it to you, especially, I've, I've talked to you guys when I was at the payer, so I, um, getting some of that, here we're going to have a piece of our data, can you match a piece of yours up to it, that's all, uh, to a payer, that's a lot of work. A lot of risk, like, is it going to be matched right? It's unfortunate, but they're, 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 it's not there yet for the, a lot of the data sharing. But there's other payers that may feel differently, and I'm not at a payer anymore, so. But. Yeah, yeah, my recommendation would be to, to go to uh, state Medicaid, uh, find one of the medical directors there, and get a grant to underwrite the cost of having a consultant come in and do that match in a black box. Thank you so much to our panel. I cannot uh, tell you how much I appreciate your time and your insight today.